I'm Brad. I'm Nick. And I'm Will. Welcome, Welcome to Brewing TV. Brewing TV. Brewing TV. TV, Welcome. we're here. Brewing <laughs> on TV. All right, we are here today in Los Angeles, California with Will Wheaton. Hello. He's uh, from such things as Tabletop and The Big Bang Theory. You might have recognized him from a couple things. Not sure, possibly. I know who he is. <laughs> um, uh, so we're going to be brewing Imperial IPA today, and uh, we're going to do that with Will Wheaton's system here. And uh, Will, would you mind walking us through your system? Yeah, sure. So uh, as a mash ton, I use a uh, Megapot, which uh, lets me control the mash temperature and uh, really do a lot really big heavy mashes. Today we're going to really test it to see exactly uh, how much we can fit in here. We're going to fill that baby up. Yeah, this is a 10 gallon mash ton, and then I've, I use a stainless steel mash paddle. I know a lot of people like to use maple or whatever, but mm -hmm. um, I prefer the stainless steel because it looks like it came from the future. And then, a battle axe. Yeah, right. Uh, then I've got uh, this tall boy that I use as my hot liquor tank. And then I've got another mega pot that I use as my boil kettle. And I've got two burners. I've got this um, Edel Metal that uh, is relatively new to my setup. And then the Bayou Classic that I think every home brewer has owned at one point or another in their life. Uh, this is my brew dog, Marlo. She is uh, always here and always on hand to help out and make sure that things work out exactly the way that they're supposed to. And then I've got this filter for, that I bought at a local homebrew supply and use that for my, uh, for my mash and also for my sparge water. Awesome, awesome. So you've got an awesome system here. Any homebrew would obviously be happy to have this, but we did bring a couple extra toys for you today to play with. Yeah, I'm super excited about this. So we got you a steelhead pump. Yeah. And we can get some recirculating mashes going and just kind of run through, through some tips and tricks there. Uh, we've also got a extra big mouth bubbler for you as well. So Yeah, fantastic. Um, so we'll get all that set up. So what Brad is doing right now is he is putting on some quick connect fittings onto the Megapots. Uh, this will allow us to be able to snap uh, hoses on and off, make recirculation super easy, and just kind of make your general brew day uh, easier. If you don't have quick connect fittings, they're not necessary, but they make your life a hell of a lot easier. Definitely recommend them. All right, now before we get to the mash in here, uh, just one trick you always want to pull with brewing an IPA is get a little gypsum in there. Um, even if you don't know your exact existing water chemistry, a little bit of gypsum, it's going to help raise your calcium level. It's going to help raise up the sulfates in the water. That's really going to help for, um, for clear, uh, clarity in the finished beer. It's going to help with the yeast health. Uh, it's going to help with um, also having the hops really stand out so you really get that up forward, up front hop flavor in the beer. And into the pot. So, how huh. much water do we need? Uh, we're looking for seven gallons. Water. Seven and gallons of water, and uh, this is going to be a beast of a batch. This mash tun is going to be incredibly full. How many pounds of grain is going into this? 21, I think. Is that right? Just shy of 21. Yeah. So, we've got in a five gallon batch of beer. That's a lot That's of grain. That's <laughs> badass. We're gonna max out this mash on essentially is what it comes down to. Today. Yeah. Crazy. 19 ounces of hops and five gallons of beer for those of you playing along. So Will, what do you got going on there? So this is my brew journal. Uh, I think keeping really good, uh, comprehensive notes is a really important part of the brewing process sure. because it lets me know like when did I, if I made a mistake or if something happened that was a little off recipe and that ended up being like really great. So I know exactly what happened. It's a great and tool it, for just being consistent. Yeah, and Absolutely. it lets me kind of go back and look at things and figure out like why did this work? Why did that not work? And then sometimes if I have a recipe that I really love, it lets me just go back and look at it again. Uh, so I've been keeping this since I started uh, when my son and I started in 2011. And then we <laughs> settled on Wheaton Zone. That's what my son and I call the beers that we make together. One of the things that I keep track of that I think most brewers don't is I always write down the music I'm listening to when I'm making the beer awesome. because it amuses me to do that. So You can't brew the same like, beer to Metallica that you can to Yanni. I mean, yeah, it's exactly, just not going to work. Exactly. But it's really useful to keep track of like exactly what steps went into brewing, what steps went into fermenting. Um, and, uh, and it's also kind of just fun to go back and sort of look through things. Like I love that it's wort stained and it's a journal of, of individual beers, but it's also like a diary of all these really wonderful and and entertaining and satisfying experiences Absolutely. I've had. Um, it's good memories. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, it's sort of, it's a little bit of a memory book. I think Perfect. it's really cool too that you pointed out that uh, you know if something goes wrong, uh, you can refer back to this thing and be like, well, this beer was amazing and not what I anticipated, but. 
okay, what caused that? Like, why yeah. is that? I've had a couple of mistakes that I've made in the brewery, and these beers were just amazing. But due to imbibing or, or <laughs> else, yeah. I don't remember exactly what I did, and now I cannot repeat that beer. I made an yeah. amazing beer, and I can't repeat it. So this is a great tool to keep yourself from doing that. That's so important to refer yeah. back to mm -hmm. as you tweak recipes Absolutely. And, and figure out exactly what, you know. The more records you keep, you can say, you know, yeah. I want a little bit more crystal malt, a little bit less crystal malt. I want to make it stronger. Let's put a little bit more base malt and malt extract in there. Um, it, this, those records are just amazing to have. Like you said, professionals do it as well. And one really important thing that they talk about is if you ever read uh, IPAs, we don't know what the old school IPAs were about because people, either those records were lost or yeah. they were destroyed in a fire. And now like that beer is gone to history. We don't know what the original IPA tasted like. The best thing we're doing is approximating what we know about the Burton style of IPA. Um, and basically Americans made it their own. And we're doing it again today but taking it up yet another notch. I mean, let's see how big and extreme we can get. This is a uniquely American, and I would Absolutely. I would even say uniquely Californian style of doing IPAs. So I've tried IPAs from different regions everywhere, and the way they do IPA in Britain is so different from the way they do IPA oh, on the East Coast, which is so different from the way they do IPA in, in the Midwest, which is really different from the way we do it out here on the West Coast. And I love that there's this one basic style that, that Brewers. Every single region's been yeah, making just sort their of like own, just out their owning own it. Thing. And, yeah, you know, exactly. I mean, West Coast IPA. Yeah, yeah it's East great. Coast IPA and All right, here we are, ready to mash in. Uh, we got our main recipe kit here, which is the, the normal double IPA. We still got some other grains in the back to add too, and that's gonna really bump up the gravity. On this one, we're gonna target a mash temperature, relatively low, we're going just under 150. And uh, what that's gonna do for us is encourage different enzymes in the malt that are gonna make a much more fermentable wort. Uh, they're gonna yield much more simple sugars, which the yeast can then get at. If we were to mash much higher than that, we're gonna start creating more complex sugars in the wort, and we're not gonna get quite as dry of a beer. And when you're brewing a big IP like this, you want a nice dry. You wanna get that as dry as possible so those hops can come out. And also in this recipe, we are keeping the crystal malts and the, the dextrin malts or the carapils pretty darn low. And why are we doing that in this? That was really interesting to me when I looked at the grain bill. Yeah, so yeah, what, what's, the, uh, what's the reasoning behind that? The reasoning behind that is if you get too many uh, caramel or crystal malts in the one batch, you can really start getting like raisiny, candy, toffee flavors, as well as a significant color contribution. Mm -hmm. And those caramel malts also provide a lot of gravity points that aren't fermentable. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna end up with a little bit of a sweeter beer, uh, something that not quite what we're going for in a big, right. big so, IPA. So what we're going for here is gonna be a real hop forward, Re really like really forward. incredibly powerful, really hot forward beer, but really if someone, dry. right, if someone wanted to do something similar to this, but have a bit of a of a malt backbone and get some more un, like less fermentable sugar that's going to uh, like increase the mouth feel and do that, they could accomplish that by putting in some more caramel malts. Or, just a dash, or like, um, like yeah. a couple of ounces, or a couple like, ounces yeah. uh, for a five-gallon batch. I would probably keep your caramel malt additions to a half pound or less. Yeah. Um, and if you really want to favor more unfermentable sugars, more mouthfeel, more body in the finished beer, I'd recommend boosting that that mash temperature. Yeah. Um, that's going to change the whole fermentability of the wort. It's going to leave you with a higher finish gravity, a bigger body in the beer, yeah. more mouthfeel. It's interesting that we're mashing at 148 because I usually mash between 152 and 155. I don't think I've ever mashed this low uh, in I have a real all dry the beers beer. we've made. Yeah, that's going to be really real interesting. Uh, tongue stinger with all these hops in and here. Why yeah. are we mashing that low? Is uh, what enzymes are active at that level? Uh, we're really focusing on the beta amylase specifically, mm -hmm. which will just nip off maltose molecules from the ends of the starch chains. Whereas a higher mash is going to favor for alpha amylase, which basically randomly cleaves these starch molecules into lesser sugars, some of which are fermentable, some of which are really not. Um, so the low mash temperature really ensures for a super fermentable wort and a really, really dry beer. Yeah, for those of you who aren't chemistry nerds, the, the, the discussion about like how sugar molecules break down and how the chains of sugar molecules are affected by the temperature of the mash is fascinating and actually really, really cool. I think- It's I, hugely I, important to the beer. Yeah, and I think it was in, it was in 
It was in How to Brew, I think, because just Palmer like loves chemistry, yeah. um, has a great book about water chemistry, yep. and went into that. And that was like, I wrapped my head kind of visually around, oh right, we're gonna break molecules off the end, and the shorter the molecules are, the more they can be fermented by the yeast, and the longer the molecules are, the harder it is exactly. for the yeast to eat them. That's and why become and, impossible and, to ferment. Yeah, and that was super interesting to me, and just like, there was, in my experiences as a home brewer, I've had these moments where I feel like, oh, I just leveled up. Everything nearly had yeah, 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 and yeah. that was one of those moments where I understood, oh, okay, so now I know why we change those things, and also why with some beers, we start out with a low mash temperature and then ra slowly raise the mash temperature, doing a couple of different steps mm -hmm. to get different kinds of sugars out of the same grain. And then we hit each one of those enzymes on the way up, and then we get a really fermentable wort. Yeah. So let's, let's do, this. do this. Let's All mash right. in. Honors. Thank you. I can already see the, mash ton, uh, see the mash ton filling up here. Yeah. This will be a fun one. One unruly beer right here. Oh, look at that. I cannot believe how thick this mash oh, is. Oh, it's going to be oatmeal. This is crazy. We still got more grains to go. So if you have the benefit of uh, of brewing with a partner or someone like, or, or a friend or just an assistant, being able to stir while you're mashing in is great. It really ensures that the grains get fully saturated all the way around. Um, if you can't do it with a partner, it's not the end of the world. You can, uh, you can mash in a little bit and stir it around and then stir it around some more, but you really, really, especially with a big beer like this IPA we're making or barley wine or like Woot Stout, you really wanna make sure that your grains are completely saturated and that there are no dough balls in your mash tun because that'll be areas where the water just doesn't get through and you don't get any sugars out and then you'll miss your gravity and you'll have a sad. Sad, sad brew day. How are we on the temp? Oh, we're at 149 and a half, so I don't know. Let's throw it out. Let's dump it. We missed it. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to essentially get our steel head running, start doing a recirculation, and then uh, we're gonna recirculate and mash until this beer is number one, converted, which is the most important thing, and number two, that everything is clear. You know, uh, that's one of the great benefits of the steelhead pump is that you don't have to worry about Vortlaufing constantly. You can just start running that thing, get a recirculation. Your, if your conversion is going to be much more efficient, and you're going to end up with just a crystal clear work coming out of that mash tun. I store we're, my equipment. In a second here, we'll yeah, be ready to put it in there. Yeah. We're so full that we can't even see the tip of the spar germ, but that's fine. Time to get the pump all hooked up, get this mash recirculating, get to conversion. It looks like Riley's decided to be a more active brew dog today than Marlo, which is uncommon. Fine. You helping? No worries. I was just thinking it'd be convenient. It's alive! Aha. Oh, look at that go. Ball valve on there. You can adjust the flow rate to get it just right so you get a nice clear like work coming out of perfect. it. that is perfect. So that's going to recirculate the work the entire time through the mash. And that's going to really speed up the whole time we're doing the process. You're gonna get conversion of the starches into sugars much faster, and you're gonna end up with a crystal clear wort, which is gonna to lead to a clearer beer and less crap in your kettle. You're also gonna end up with a real uniform, uh, uniform temperature. So as we're heating it, we'll heat the bottom up, but then we'll recirculate that hot back to the top and just keep it nice and even, one even consistent temperature all the way through the mash, which will uh, hopefully ensure a really good conversion of starches. Now we are going to be filling our hot liquor tank with water. And we only need uh, three and three quarter gallons of sparge water. All right, I'll fill it to four just Yeah, for, since we got that dead we space that there. Dead spa Actually, I'm gonna fill it to a little more than four because of that dead space. All right, well, now that we have got our mash going here, getting on an hour, we are heating up our sparge water. Uh, so this should only take a few minutes. We don't have a whole lot in there since pretty much our entire volume that we're gonna boil is 
in the mash right now. Um, so we're just getting our sparge water going. Uh, we're gonna raise that up to about 170 degrees, give or take a couple degrees. And uh, once we're ready to run off into our boil kettle, we will rinse out all the grains in the mash tun with the sparge water. All right, so we're uh, applying a little bit more heat now back to yep. the mash tun. So let's explain to the kids at home uh, what a mash out is and why sure. we do it. All right, well basically what we're doing now is we lost a couple degrees on our main mash temperature. So we've been applying heat a little bit here and there as we recirculate just to make sure that we're maintaining that nice mash temperature so we get a nice even conversion. Uh, and now, now that our mash is pretty much complete, what we're gonna do is keep applying heat as we recirculate. And what that's gonna do is we're gonna raise that temperature to about 168 degrees. It has a couple of functions. One, what it does is it halts all enzymatic activity in the mash. So basically we are fixing the ferment fermentability profile. This stops the sugar molecules from separating and getting into different sizes. It yeah, basically, those enzymes ba are yeah, basically we're like, we're like, that'll do pig, that'll do. That'll do. And, and we're warming so, up the water to shut off, shut off those the, enzymes, the, the enzymatic action, yep, of the, uh, and make the chemistry stop. Which is another thing that I think is really cool. Helps <laughs> denaturing the enzymes. And yes. the the second best thing about doing a a mash out is we're warming that liquid up, which is making all those dissolved sugars just that much more soluble. Uh, the viscosity of the overall liquid is going to drop, making it much easier to run off into our boil kettle. Um, oh, hi there, dog hair. Um, so we're at uh, just about 90 degrees, and we're going to heat this water up to about 170, and then we will we'll change these couplings so that we're going to pull water out of this tank and put it back through this sparge arm into here, and we're going to sprinkle water over the grain bed, and we're going to collect all of the liquid that we have been uh, uh, mashing and getting sugars into in this little kettle down here. And uh, then eventually, through the magic of us moving things around, we'll be boiling in this little guy right here. So once the water is warm enough in here, we will uh, connect one of the ends of, uh, we'll connect that end here, and we'll just start pumping it through to sprinkle it over the top of the grain bed. This is really exciting for me because this is what they do in professional breweries. Sure is. And I have never done it this way. I have always just filled up a tank and grabbed a measuring cup and just slowly drizzled the measuring cup over um, after I recirculate. Now, I have a question. Normally, when I finish my mash, before I start sparging, I recirculate by opening up that ball valve like yep. maybe a quarter of the way. I collect about a quart of, uh, of the wort, um, which is full of little grain, grain bits particles, and stuff. Cloudy. Yeah. Then I close it off, I pour it back in, and I do that a number of times until I feel like the grain bed has settled down exactly. and it's running a little bit more clear. I never get exactly. it as clear as you get it in a, in a brewery, but that's okay. I'm yeah, all so that's a, the, the so, manual Vorloff. And yeah. It's so pain in the neck. Because we've been circulating all this time, am I gonna need to do that? Absolutely not. Nope. That's so cool. <laughs> That's really great. So that also saves time for, saves time. for a brewer. Uh, you get better efficiency. Usually the matches convert faster. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you don't have to do the pain in the neck manual of Orloff with yeah. a little pitcher or something. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the way everyone Hands starts. Are all sticky. And it's definitely great to be able to move to this. And I mean, really, when you think about the time and the mess and the exp it, it's yeah. worth it's worth just making that jump. Yeah. So. Um, one of the things I've really loved about this hobby is that I was able to start out with um, one very small kettle that I think had a boil volume of about four gallons and one stainless steel spoon and a bucket for fermenting mm -hmm. and just doing extracts and specialty grains and it was really fun and I made some really great beer when I did that Absolutely. and what I've one of the things I've loved about this is that I'm 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 very privileged and I'm very fortunate that I can afford to add slightly better equipment so that I can do more things yep. in my brew house so which is a actually long, a slow brew patio process. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then as I grow out of equipment I give it to my son and you know he's been you know he's yeah. Building out, building it's the best out thing. His own brew brew house. equipment is always a great hand-me-down, and yeah. as long as you take care of it, it'll last the brew forever. Yeah. And that's a really fun thing about this hobby. Not only can you constantly change and enhance your equipment, but I mean, you're always learning, right? You're always yeah. learning something new, and that's what's really special about this hobby in general. Yeah. I've also found just like as it as a general rule, I have not yet encountered 
a, a home brewer who's a dick, right? I've been really lucky in that when I have a question, every home brewer I have ever encountered is like, here, let me help you. Right? Here's let me, let, me, let, me, let me give you the answers that, that you need, and let me give you the answers that you need at a level where you can appreciate and understand them, right? There's, I've never, ever seen someone go, God, noob, I can't believe you don't know that. Like, <laughs> I've, ne <laughs> I've never experienced, and I'm, I'm sure they exist, yeah. but I've never experienced a gatekeeper in home brewing. It's been like, oh, you love this? Let's love it together. Exactly. True. Yeah, it, it is very different in that regard than to like gaming or something like that, where someone will just mock you for not knowing the, uh, right. not knowing the answer, but, uh, yeah, like you said, vastly, uh, far and away, everyone is really helpful and really, uh, really willing to encourage you because they want to see you make better beer too, right? Because yeah. the big thing is they don't want to drink your terrible beer. So, right. like, <laughs> if you can make if you can make better beer, then I can drink your awesome beer too. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it, it is great in that way as well. All right, now one kind of final test we can do just to see if the mash is fully converted is do what's called an iodine test. Uh, so Will's got a nice white porcelain or white ceramic plate. Yep. And uh, basically what we're gonna do is we're just gonna collect a tiny bit of this word down here. So what we're doing is we're finding out if there's still sugar left in here that we need to uh, extract. Yeah, yeah, if there's still starches that need to be converted into sugar. So do you want to hold yeah, that? Yeah, hold it for you. And so uh, do over the mash tun? Yeah, let's Probably not over the mash yeah. tun. <laughs> I done. It's great. So what we're looking for is how this is going to change color. Uh, iodine reacts with starches and lets us know if there's still stuff in there to be converted. Looks like we're pretty well converted. Yeah. 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 Yep. Otherwise, it would turn a deep purple. Yep. Deep purple indicates there's still starches, so we can assume that we have converted all of the starches uh, in the grain to sugars. We're ready to sparge. For people who are making a move from uh, extract brewing or partial mashing to all grain brewing, this is really useful, super cheap, easy way to make sure that you've gotten everything out of the mash that you need to make your beer. Iodine's like, I don't know, two bucks if it even costs that at a drugstore. And literally it's one drop in a plate like that. And if it doesn't change to that deep dark color, you're set, you're ready to go. Pro tip on iodine, this is probably the most staining substance in the history of life. So be very, very careful when you use it. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so if we take a look down here, this is one way, uh, one real big advantage you can get from a pump is you look at how crazy clear that wort is that's being recirculated in there. Wort laughing by hand, it's gonna be really difficult to get that. And once you see that when you're done mashing or when you're going through the mash, you know you're really close to done. Um, so at this point, basically, we can start uh, we can start to louder and we can start to collect in our boil kettle. And as luck would have it, the sparge water is at 170 degrees. Boom. So shall I turn the pump off? Yep, let's turn the pump off. Okay. Want to make sure we get these valves closed again so we don't have a catastrophic wort spill. Uh, I am not ashamed to admit that I have had <laughs> at least one catastrophic wort spill in my life. All right, another thing. So what we're going to do now mm -hmm. is switch this hose coming off the bottom of the mash tun, we're gonna put it on the output of the sparge kettle. So that way we can recirculate the hot water back on top of the mash. So we'll just disconnect that, throw it over there. Careful, it's hot. And then with this extra tube, we will run off into our boil kettle. Which is currently being cleaned right now. So now we're gonna start the runoff. We're gonna take the wort we just uh, just created in the mash tun here, slowly run it out into the kettle where we're collect it to boil it in a bit. So we will we will just get a nice slow flow going here. And now you want to try and match your flow rates from your hot liquor tank through your mash tun to your boil kettle so that you end up generally sparging for about an hour. We're kind of old school, we like doing the long fly sparge. Um, not everyone's into that, that's cool, do your own thing, but this is the way that we that we rock it, so. Right, let's kick that pump back on. And then we will slowly open the pump until we see that roughly the same volume of water coming through there again. It's just the wort left in the tube. We should clear, we should start getting some nice clean sparge water. And there we go. There, it is. there you go. All right. Well, let's dial really, back that flow a little bit. 
that very dramatically uh, points out how clear the the wort is. Yeah. I was like, yeah, that's clear wort, but wow, that's clear wort. <laughs> Speak to me about hops. All right, well, just to demonstrate.